All right, here we go. We have actor T.C. Carson in the building. Welcome to Vlad TV. Thank you, brother. I appreciate it. Hey, man, long time fan. Uh, Living Single was my joint. <laughs> I used to watch it every every week. What well, cool. Thank you. Oh, uh, yeah, and also a big fan of the stuff you did with video games as well. Oh, yeah, I love the, um, the video game work, man. I really do like doing studio work. Oh, yeah. Uh, I was planning on being Kratos uh, this year for Halloween, but unfortunately, you know, it just didn't work out. Next year. COVID and everything. Next year. Next year. Next, next year. year. <laughs> I'll be working out to try to get a little more buffed <laughs> up. But... <laughs> okay, so this is your first time here, so I want to, you know, get the whole story. So you grew up in Chicago. Yes. Okay. And what was Chicago like in the 60s and 70s? Well, I grew up in um, the projects, LeClaire Courts. It was a projects out on the southwest side of Chicago, out by Cicero. And um, it was what they called the low risers. The, we didn't have really tall buildings. The tallest building was three stories. Um, we lived in a two-story, basically, town home. Uh, but it was the projects. We had upstairs, downstairs. We both had a room. I'm, my mother was a single parent. Um, we had a single parent household. And um, the projects weren't, <laughs> they weren't bad when I was growing up. You know, we had, um, people took care of each other. They had a, they built a pool for us. There was a uh, clubhouse in the summertime. So they did things for us. So a lot of the turmoil that you hear about that time, we didn't really experience out there where we were. Okay. Now, you grew up in a single in a single family home, in a single parent home, mm -hmm. but you had a relationship with your father. Yes, yes, okay. I did. So, uh, were your parents just not married, or did they divorce, or what happened? Uh, my there? parents were never married. They were never married, and um, I did have a relationship with my father, but he did not live with us. Okay. Now, when you talk about Chicago in the seventies, mm -hmm. uh, it was kind of a, a crazy time. Uh, I mean, with the gang culture, with, you know, Larry Hoover and Jeff Fort, you know, their whole organization started to build up into, into the thousands mm -hmm. at that point. Did you ever get kind of mixed up in the streets at all? Or did you kind of stay out the way? No, man, I was a very nerdy kid. <laughs> I didn't really hang out with the gangs. Um, I had relatives that lived in the project. So my cousin made sure that his um, younger siblings and his younger cousins were not bothered by the um, brothers in the gangs. Okay, so you were, you were a school kid? Pretty much, yeah. Mm -hmm. I was artistic, you, you know, I was creative. Yeah. I, I drew, I painted, I made things. Um, only child, I'm in the house. What you gonna do? <laughs> I, I feel you, I'm the only child as well. Oh, you see, know? so I you was, know. I was the same, the same type of way. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't trying to be around a bunch of people like that. Right. <laughs> uh, okay, so, you grew up in Chicago, you graduate high school, mm -hmm. um, then you go to college. You go yes, to uh, University of Illinois, uh, Urbana-Champaign. Yes. Studied architecture and interior design. Yep. Now, why that? Um, it was something I really wanted to do. I really wanted to build my mother a house. Mm -hmm. And so I figured, well, if I want to build her a house, then I need to learn how to build a house. So I went to school for architecture. I realized that I liked interior design better. Um, it wasn't as technical, and so I kind of switched over. Okay. Now, you're going to college, but you don't really have a lot of money at this point. So you've right. got to work a bunch of jobs to try to even, you know, you know, pay your tuition and, and room and board and so forth. How tough was that? It was pretty rough. I was working two jobs and going to school. Uh, my mom just couldn't afford it. Uh, I got a couple of scholarships, but they, you know, ended the first year. So after that, I had to work. And, you know, you do what you got to do. So you worked as a doorman. Yeah. And uh, and I'm quoting you here. You said, I hated the subservience of it as a black man. But Absolutely. I know that I needed to work. You had, um, I had just moved back to Chicago from U of I. Uh, my father actually got me that gig. Uh, he worked as a doorman in a building a few um, blocks down. So he knew these people over here. So he got me that job. It wasn't the fact that I had to open doors or answer phones. It was the way people treated you because you opened the door. Mm. You know, like you were a non-entity. And 
it let me know that this was something that I did not want to do for the rest of my life. And it made me really push forward in the dreams that I had. Oh, yeah. There's nothing like the worst job during the struggle. <laughs> right? Yeah. You know? uh, oh, yeah. Now, I remember when I was trying to be a DJ, I, I DJed at this failing strip club in Brooklyn where like two or three people would show up a night. <laughs> and and I just remember I was like 30 at the time going like, is this, like, where did I make a wrong turn to end up right here? Let me get the hell up out of here as quickly as possible. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. You definitely need that to kind of drive you to, to do better things. Do you really? <laughs> I think so. Okay. I think I think so. I, I think so. Okay. I think everyone goes through the struggle to a yeah. certain degree. If you if you don't go through it, I don't think you really achieve the greatness or even appreciate it when it is presented to you. That part, I don't think you appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. I don't think you appreciate it. Okay. So, at what point did the acting start coming around? Well, I started doing theater and music in grade school. Uh, they had a program back then called the Title VI program. They bought brought music and theater and dance to inner city kids. And that started in fifth grade. And I continued that through my um, middle school years. Okay. And then once you went to college, did you still continue to do plays and so forth? Absolutely. I was um, doing theater. I was dancing. I was in the black chorus. Um, yeah, I did quite a bit. That's why it was hard for me in college because I was doing too much. And working, you know. Right, because at one point you just drop out of school. Yeah, I left. I had about a semester and a half to go, something like that. And I ran out of money. I was tired. Yeah. And I realized so, that um, I wanted to do what I'm doing now. I wanted to sing. I wanted to be on stage. And I was going to school for something that I was not going to be doing. Right. So was there like a move to Hollywood, to L.A. at one point? I moved to L.A. when I got living single. Aha. So before then, you were still in Chicago? Yes. Okay. So how did you end up uh, getting that gig? Just auditioned for it. And they had actually, I thought they were going to hire somebody else because they told me thanks, but no thanks. And then they came back and said, we want you to come out and, uh, and screen test for the role. He was the last character they were hiring. And I came in on a Tuesday. Uh, we went and screen test on Wednesday, and I went to work Thursday. Okay, and the auditions, they were in Chicago? No, I went to, they flew, the original audition was in Chicago. It, we taped it, ah. but they flew me out for the screen test. Okay, so after auditioning in Chicago, you were one of the standouts. They flew you out, did the further testing. They said, okay, this is, this is our Kyle right here. Correct. Okay, so, you know, out of the blue, you go from someone that's doing theater that's not really making a lot of money to suddenly you're on a major sitcom? Well, not necessarily out of the blue. I had had a series before that called Key West with Fisher Stevens and Jennifer Tilly. Um, I had had a, a movie called Living Large before mm. that. So, but I will say that this was the first time that I was with a cast like I was with and on a major net. Well, no, because um, Key West was on Fox as well. Um, but it was the move to California. It was the um, changing, it was a life-changing moment because I left LA. I mean, I left Chicago and moved to LA. So, I mean, Living Single was sort of an interesting show because you had the Cosby show. That was a, a massive hit. But that was kind of more focused on the kids, mm -hmm. you know, high school, junior high, even elementary school. Uh, then you had a different world mm -hmm. which focused on you know, the college, the 19, 20, 21 year olds. But this was sort of like the next step where now you have sort of 20 somethings that are, you know, have jobs and are professional. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was almost like a transition into, into this show in terms of like the culture and the lifestyle. Mm -hmm. uh, when you first heard about the show, and the show is actually written and produced by a black woman, uh, Yvette Lee Bowser. That's correct. Uh, you know, when you first started learning about the show after getting the gig, what did you think? It was a hard, it was a rough transition to learn how to function in Hollywood, how to function on a set, um, on a sitcom set. Uh, when we did uh, Key West, it was episodic. 
So it was, there were no jokes. There were, you know, it wasn't like that. It was real life, more real life. Living single was a different, um, a different bird to tackle. But because I came from theater, the transition, I understood what it was. I just had to figure it out. You know, um, I didn't really know the show would be what it is. What, what it is for people and what it is for the culture. But I did understand that we had a chance to do something different. Okay. Now, the cast is very interesting in terms of like the four, the four female leads mm -hmm. on the show. You have Kim Fields, who had already done Facts of Life, which was like a big, a big major sitcom already. Mm -hmm. She was one of, the, one of the main characters on there. Uh, you had Kim Coles. Was she fairly established at this point or not? Really? She was, um, she came from In Living Color. Ah, right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Which was a big hit as well. Mm -hmm. uh, your nemesis, uh, Eric Alexander. <laughs> Initially your nemesis, you know, eventually you got my baby. <laughs> um, had she done stuff before? Uh, or oh, yeah, she had been on Cosby before? Show. Ah, right. Okay, there you go. And then you had Queen Latifah. Mm hmm who, I mean, she had done some stuff, I think, on Fresh Prince. Yes. But this was an actual lead role. Yes. It almost seemed like, I mean, would you say the show was kind of built around Queen Latifah a little bit? Was she sort of the main star in a way? Or it was really? built around Queen Latifah and Kim Coles. Kim Coles. Okay, there yeah. you go. They, were, they okay. were the two main characters that they built everybody else around. Uh, when you first started interacting with the cast and sort of seeing how you know, the show was about, what did you think? <laughs> that this was going to be fun. <laughs> um, they were all such interesting people, but we all understood that we had to be together in order to make this work. And so we fostered the friendship. We hung out with each other. We went to each other's houses, you know. Um, so the friendship you see on stage is, is real. We do like each other. And I think that happened immediately when we were in the room together after the first table read. Right. And they really, you know, took a chance, I think, on Queen Latifah. Because right now, everyone knows who she is. And I mm -hmm. think she had won an Oscar already and so forth. But back then, I mean, she was the rapper, essentially. She was the female rapper. And she had a little bit of stuff, you know, on, on Fresh Prince. But really, I mean, you didn't really see rappers becoming... Well, I mean, I guess you saw it with, with Will Smith. Mm -hmm. So I guess that kind of set the stage. But you didn't see a lot of rappers sort of going into mainstream, you know, acting roles like you see today. Right. So I, I think that the network kind of, you know, gambled on that and it, and it really worked out. I believe it did. <laughs> really did. Yeah. Now, with your character, sort of like a smooth kind of ladies' man kind of character. But from what I understand, they originally wrote you to kind of be a buffoon. Well, they wrote both men characters to be more like Lenny and Squiggy. Right. And um, we were, I forgot what episode we were taping, but they wanted us to do something. And we kind of went, you know, we can't do this like this. And we talked to them and got them to understand that you cannot have four strong black women with two buffoonish black men. It doesn't, it doesn't look right. You know, why would, I be a, why would I be crazy and a buffoon if I'm a stockbroker? That makes no sense to me. You know? Right. So, um, and to their credit, they tweaked it. They tweaked it. I think, I think they had a, one idea of what the show was going to be, but then when they saw us together, when they saw how we interacted with each other, then things started to shift. Was the show a hit in the beginning or did it take a couple seasons for it to? to no, it was a hit up? in the beginning mm, when it first okay. came out. That's why they cloned it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll get to all that. Uh, okay, so, uh, don't look at me in that tone of voice, David. My publicist is here and he's looking at me like, mm -hmm. like oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Okay. So so you're one of the main characters on the show uh throughout. You know, at one point you actually even got two NAACP Image Awards or nominations, I guess. Mm -hmm. Nominations, yes. For an outstanding lead actor in a comedy series. But then at one point there started to be some friction uh between you and I guess the writers? Well, it, was, it wasn't just me. And see, people are trying to make it seem like I had problems with them. No, the cast had issues. And when we would have issues, I wound up being the spokesperson for those things. 
So we'd have meetings and I would be the one to speak. Um, and there were things that, you know, we were the B team. We were the, we were on the B lot, you know, so there were things that were um, less than, you know, and we fought for that. We fought for our characters. We fought for writing for our characters. We fought for situations. Uh, yeah, I mean, I remember uh, we interviewed John Amos, and uh, when he was working on Good Times, uh, he always fought for the characters on the show. Mm -hmm. Like, he wanted his son to go to college. He wanted his daughter, you know, on the show to be a judge, uh, you know, go to law school. But instead, <laughs> they would have JJ doing dynamite and wearing the chicken hat and, and so forth. And I remember he got to the point where he started actually threatening some of the writers. Oh, wow. So I wasn't the most diplomatic guy, so very often it would end in me saying, well, let's go outside then. <laughs> and, and the writers, they were, these were Hollywood writers. They weren't used to that. What do you mean we go outside? The black man let's go outside and us. talk about this. It's a scary black man. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that. I never did that. I never did that. <laughs> And he ended up getting fired at one point. They ended up killing off his character mm. uh, after a couple of seasons. They just got tired of him threatening everybody. And, you know, <laughs> it was what it was. But you would be the spokesman that would go speak to, I guess, whoever you needed to speak to about problems with the show and so forth. Um, and I guess right around the same time, on the same Warner Brothers lot, they started doing Friends. Well, that was like... Right after our first season. Yeah. Yeah. So here you are, season two of a hit show, and they have this other show that's very similar to your show, except everyone's white. Mm -hmm. And you saw like a difference between they were the way they were treated and the way the living single cast was treated? Bruh. <laughs> Come on, man. Well, well, tell me the specific differences that you saw. Uh, friends worked on the big lot, so they got access to all the amenities that were on the big lot. At the end of it, they were making $100,000 an episode. Oh, no, a million dollars an episode, something mm -hmm. like that. Um, we didn't approach, at least I never approached any of those numbers. Um, they, had better, they had better services. They had better craft services. They had better cost, um, trailers. You know, but at the time, we didn't care. We were working on the show we were working on. And quite frankly, I was happy to have a gig. And I knew that we, what we were doing was important. So it didn't matter what they were doing. I saw it. But that's kind of what happens in, in Hollywood with, with what we do. We're always second tier. You know, and so it didn't, it was typical. It wasn't anything that was unusual to me. What I What I didn't like is that I know that Yvette created this show, and I know that they they took that and created another one. I don't think she got credit for that. Well, you said that as the show progressed, uh, you saw less uh, black writers, and you guys started to have less input. Um, no, I never said that. Um, because there were always black writers on our show. What happened, we had um, Yvette left, and we got two um, white producers. Okay. That were over the writers. So the, the situations became more sitcom y. Um, and nice guys, talented guys. It just, for me, when um, we take our stories and put them in the hands of somebody else, they become a little watered down. They are because the culture is not understood. So when you're in that situation, you hope that the other people on the other side of the table understand that you live this so they will listen to you and at least take it into consideration. And that's what they did. They, they would take it into consideration. Okay. Again, I, I don't, I don't want to um, make it seem like my time on Living Single was so tumultuous because it was not. We had moments that were not good, but my time on Living Single was a lot of fun. I got to work with people that I cared about that were funny as hell. And I got paid for that. I got paid to go to work and play. But what I did want was for the representation that we were giving to be more accurate. And that's what we fought for. Right. And the show had a lot of really dope, uh, like, 
guest characters. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, Heavy D would show up. Uh, Khalil Kane, who I've interviewed, uh, showed up. Uh, Ron O'Neill. Gladys Knight. Uh, Gladys Knight, Tatiana Ali. Mm-hmm. Um, Michael Jai White showed up. He's, he's a regular guest Pounder. on my show. CCH Pounder. Yep. Yep. Uh, Morris Chestnut, uh, Arsenio Hall, Mark <laughs> yeah, Curry, <yeah. laughs> Kareem Abdul Jabbar, uh-huh. Deion Sanders. This was almost, I mean, Q Tip, Will Ferrell. <laughs> like, this almost seemed like, okay, everyone needs to at least have a, a few seconds of, of screen time. You know, all the, all the hot sort of celebrities felt like they, they needed a little, a little screen time on this show. And that was the great part about being there. You got a chance to meet some of everybody, you know, that yeah. wanted to be there. They wanted to be on this show. Oh, yeah. And, and we're just getting into a very small list of people. I mean, <laughs> Evander Holyfield, Vivica Fox, yeah. Shaka Khan, who we just interviewed, uh, DJ Premier, T-Boz from TLC. Yeah, all three of them. All mm. three of them were there. Yep. Yep. Okay. So you're doing this show and you become kind of the spokesman for the rest of the cast to go with issues. Uh you know, to the producers. And at one point, I guess they tell you that your role is secured and you have no issues or whatever else, but then you find out that you got fired. Yeah. So so how did that come about? Well, um, it had been written that I was going to London. So I asked some people, the writers, I said, so are you all getting ready to fire me? I just need to know so I can tie up some things and, you know, have my life straight. Um, I was in the middle of um, <laughs> creating a, a new space to live, you know, so I just needed to know. And then, no, no, we'll never break up the group. We'll never, never fight. No, 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 we wouldn't do that. We wouldn't do that. And then I'm watching the episode when I'm leaving to go to London. And not even five minutes later, my phone rings. It's my lawyer calling me to tell me that they're not bringing me back next year. And that was it. And... You know, it's not the first time I've been fired. I've been fired before, but it was the way it was done. It was the way it was done. I had I had given a lot for that show, and I thought I deserved a little bit better than that. But it is what it is. Yeah, and from what I understand, uh, Erica Alexander, who you know you had a lot of sort of chemistry with throughout the you know throughout the series, she actually cried when she found out that you were fired. Mm. Yeah, she was. Well, you know, we were. We were like Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers. I was her, she was my other half. I was her other half. And how would you feel if you were working and somebody took your other half away? I mean, did that really put you in a bad space? You're talking about you're getting a new place and, you know, you're thinking that you have another season at least, if not more, on this hit show and you've got, you know, this money that you think is coming and then suddenly, boom, it stops. Uh, did that mess you up financially? Oh, of course it did. But, you know, it wasn't so much financially. Like, I had to readjust some things. But it was the backlash from people knowing I was fired. And, you know, I gave the company line. You know, I was fired because, well, you know, they needed to make some changes. And because this is what they told me. They needed to make some changes. And Overton had just married Sinclair. So they weren't getting rid of the girls. You were the logical person. I'm like, okay, cool. Um, but what I found out was being told was that I was a problem, that I was coming in late, that I did not know my lines. And it's one thing to fire me, but don't don't disparage my name. Don't not my work ethic. I'm really clear about what I do, and I come to work prepared. I come to work on time. You know, so um, that was the thing that was hurtful, because that made it hard for me to work. Right, because I guess you were talking about going to an audition. And uh, the guy that was doing the interview with you mm-hmm. was, I guess, a black man. And there were some other white people around. Mm-hmm. And he said, well, before we start, I'd heard that you're difficult to work with and you come in late and everything else like that. And you just walked out. Well, I said, I just stopped him. I said, I think this, this interview is over. I thank you for your time. I got my stuff and left. And because why? it makes no sense for me to sit here and let you do that to me. For whatever reason you were doing it, doesn't matter. Obviously, you don't want me to have this job. So cool, let me leave. But to find out that that's what people were saying was was really hurtful. That took me out for a couple of days. I bet. Well, you know, to play devil, devil's advocate, you know, 
the the coming in late and everything that sounded just like just a bad rumor from an employer's point of view you have someone that's working for you you're paying them and if they're constantly complaining about the job from their point of view they could say well this person's difficult to work with now from your point of view it's more than just a job you know this is the you know the ramifications in the community of what you're doing and the image you're portraying mm-hmm. but you know, th- there is an argument on both sides. So, I mean, would you agree to a certain degree? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I, but again, it wasn't constant complaining. And the things we were, fi- again, it wasn't just me. It was us. And we but, were- But you're the, you're the spokesman though. Well, so yeah. it, becomes, it becomes just you to a certain degree. Yeah, to them. Yes, it does. To them. Yeah, that's it what does. I'm saying. You know, from the employer's point of view, not, not from your point of view, mm-hmm. from the employer's point of view. So you, you know, cut the problem um, out. You cut the problem yeah. out. Yeah. But the show wasn't uh, the same after that. So it was one more season after that, mm-hmm. after you left? Yes. Okay. Uh, why did it end after that that extra season? Um, it wasn't the same show. Mm. Yeah. Period. Yeah. It wasn't the same show. When you heard that the show ended one season later, how did you feel? I was sorry my friends didn't have a job anymore. You know, but I had... I had let it go a while ago, you know, um, once I saw that they replaced me with two people, Mm. you know, so it wasn't about money. It was really about just cutting the head off, you know, and making everybody else fall in line. How did Queen Latifah feel during that time when when you were complaining and so forth? Was she kind of too scared to complain herself because she was sort of brand new or was she really kind of just as angry as everyone else. She was just, I mean, we were all in the same place. I was the oldest person. Mm. So I became elected to be that person, you know. You know, a lot of times when you're a new actor, and this goes kind of across the board for entertainment in general, you don't sign the best deals. You don't get offered the best contracts. Mm -hmm. Based on, you know, and I'm I'm not trying to get in your pockets, but based on the deal that you signed, did you continue to get royalties off the show? Because it's still in circulation and, you know, it got, you know, reruns mm-hmm. and, and so forth. And I'm sure it's gotten picked up by various streaming platforms and so forth. Did you continue to benefit financially from being on that show or not so much? Absolutely. There you go. So continue to watch everyone. Continue to tune in. Because <laughs> every time you do, it's a cha-ching for us. <laughs> there, there <laughs> yes, sir. There we go. Well, one thing that you said, I think it was on a Comedy Hype uh, interview, you said uh, this entertainment business was built on black people's backs, Mm -hmm. but they don't respect the people that it was built on. Mm -hmm. I believe that. Explain that. Um, Because none of these systems were built for us. All of these systems are built to service you. So the things that we do are only meant to service. And so you don't really, you don't really honor the cook for what he made. You like the food. Mm. You know, the maid, you don't honor her for cleaning your house. You just like the fact that your house is clean. So that's how it, you know, until we have more control over what we put out and how we make the money from it, it's going to, that's the way it feels. But we are getting more control. We are um, having more control over our images and over the pockets that um, produce those images. Well, right. I mean, because people really have to understand. I mean, in 2020, you could create a YouTube channel like Vlad TV and, and have millions of people watching it every day. Uh, mm-hmm. You could have a Facebook page with millions of followers. You could have YouTube. Uh, you could go to Snapchat. You can go to TikTok. <laughs> uh, you, you know, you could sell your content to Netflix uh, mm-hmm. or 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 Amazon Video or or whoever else the new streaming service is. You know, Quibi that came and went. You know. People, people got paid off of that, you know, for a Wait, short Wait, there's no time. more Quibi? There's no there's more no, Quibi. Quibi's, Quibi's going away. Ah. Rest, in peace, rest in peace, Quibi. Throw out, pour out a little liquor for Quibi. That, that, that billion dollars they got just didn't, didn't quite work out. But <laughs> I, I think just, just to be fair, during the 90s when you were doing this, there really was no independent anything. You right. were either hooked up with the major networks mm-hmm. or you just did local theater. Yeah. Pretty much. There, there was no really in between. Right. 
you know, so your, your hands are kind of tied having to work with, with these networks on their terms. Well, for me, it was, it was a little different because I do more than one thing. So when the film and television stuff stopped, and then I, I went to theater and I went to voiceover work. So I continued yeah. to work. I just wasn't working in that medium. Well, Friends, that you could say was, was based off of uh, Living Single. Could you say that? <laughs> I, think I think you could say that. Went on to be, uh, I mean, one of the biggest sitcoms ever on mm -hmm. television. Mm -hmm. Where would it rate? Let me see. Biggest, let's just Google it. <laughs> biggest sitcoms ever. Seinfeld, uh, Friends. Let me see. The biggest sitcom of all time. I mean, Seinfeld is number one. Mm -hmm. Uh, see, the problem is everyone's putting in the best sitcoms. I don't really care okay. about that. I care about like what rating wise, you know, what like was the, the number one? Ratings. Yeah. You know, I, I would say you could put friends in the top five or top ten I would of think all so. time. I would think so. Yeah. Uh well, at one point, not too long ago, uh, David Schwimmer, one of the stars <laughs> from Friends, had some interesting comments. He said, maybe this should be an all-black Friends or an all-Asian Friends, at which point your co-star, uh, Eric Alexander, <laughs> said, hey, David Schwimmer, are you seriously telling me you've never heard of Living Single? We invented the template. You're welcome, bro. <laughs> yes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And he responded, he said, hi, Erica, as you know, I was asked recently in an interview uh, for The Guardian how I felt for the thousandth time about a reboot of Friends, immediately following a conversation about diversity on the show. Because there were no black people on that show, right? <laughs> in, I New mean, I mean, in New York. In New York. there are no In New York. <laughs> I mean, the, the cast itself, I mean, I, I'll be honest, I never watched Friends. Friends was never my show. Let me, right. let me just put that out there. I know the main cast was all white. Were any of the guest stars at all black at all or not so much? I think... Um, What's his name? Tay Diggs came on for a okay. minute, I think. Um, but I'm not sure who else after that. Yep. I'd have to look it up. So he said, uh, you know, I was asked for a thousand times about a reboot of Friends, immediately following a conversation about diversity on the show, and so offered up other possibilities for a reimagining of the show today. I didn't mean to imply Living Single hadn't existed or indeed hadn't come before Friends, which I knew it had. Okay. Yeah. Backpedal. Backpedal. <laughs> Backpedal. <laughs> uh -huh. But, you know, it's, again, we have to remember, this is not everybody's world. You know, black television, everybody doesn't watch black television. Oh, I, I think, I'll be honest, though. During that time, I don't feel like Living Single was seen as a black show. That's good. Just just like the Cosby show or Different World were seen as black shows. They really, I felt, were just universally. But understand, uh, understand, they thought it would, they were black shows. The powers okay. that be, everybody, that it was a black show. Now, public may have that impression that it was just a, a great show. They didn't see the color. But networks, ratings, black show. Well, I mean, I'm looking it up. The first season of... Uh, you know, uh, Living Single had a 9.3 million viewers. That is not just a strictly black audience. It just no, it's not. But it's still you're considered not, you're a black not getting, show. You're not getting numbers. You're not getting numbers like that if only black people are watching the show. I didn't say that. Only, I, I didn't say only black people. I said not a lot of other people were watching black television. That show was different. And again, yeah. the networks, it was a black show for them. It wasn't just a show. Friends was just a show. Living Single was their black show. So you leave the show, and then you start doing some movies. Mm -hmm. uh, in 1997, you did Gang Related. Mm -hmm. What year was this actually filmed? I want to say 98. Well, it came out in 97. So if it came out, in, it came out a year after we did it. So then 96. 96. Mm -hmm. So Tupac is the co-star uh -huh. of, of this film. Did you and uh, Tupac interact a lot when you guys were working on the movie? Um, we had conversations in between uh, takes. And he was not what I expected him to be. Explain. Um, you know, I didn't really 
understand rap world too much. You know, I just knew what I knew and heard what I heard. And so I took it as face value. Um, so I figured he would be like I saw him on videos, and that's who he would be. Um, but he was such a well-read, um, intelligent, articulate brother. We had really interesting conversations about politics and music and world views, and it was something I didn't expect. You know, I was really sad when he uh, when he got murdered. Right, because before the movie came out, he got killed. Yeah, uh, I mean the same year. Because that's why I was trying to figure out the timeline. Because he got killed in 1996. Which so we had to be must have been right after he filmed this movie. It wasn't long after. It wasn't long yeah. after. I remember that was like maybe five months or something like that. I have to look on the, at the timeline, but it, I remember it was really quick. Anything crazy happened with Tupac on set? Because he was going through a very tumultuous time. You know, for example, I just interviewed Leon, right? Mm -hmm. The actor. And he worked on Above the Rim with Tupac. Okay. And what he said was, on set, Tupac was perfect. Mm -hmm. Show up on time. Know his lines. Very professional. But <laughs> as soon as it turned into offset hours, Tupac shot two cops in Atlanta. Uh, you know, and they had to stop stop filming and, and rearrange the, the days and everything else like that. Uh, Tupac got into fights on set. Um, he was handing out blunts to the audience. There was arguments. It was, it was, it was very chaotic. <laughs> just having blunts Tupac to the around. audience. <laughs> well, yeah, to the, you know, the crowds because they were filming the basketball scene. Like he said, it was just absolute chaos when dealing with Tupac, <laughs> you know, when, when the cameras would, would shut off. Here you are working on Above the Rim, and then someone tells you, hey, by the way, your co-star just shot two cops in Atlanta yesterday. Yeah, no, even worse than that, you know, I, I, I just look at the morning paper. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I guess we're not doing that scene today. <laughs> and I guess uh, he was passing out blunts to the to the crowd when you guys were doing the basketball scenes oh, yeah, and so yeah, forth. Yeah, 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 he was, he, he was, he was true to his character. Definitely. Okay. <laughs> was there any of that with gang related? No, I didn't see any of that. I didn't have very many days that I was on set with him. So okay. it was like maybe two or three days I was on set with him. So I didn't see a lot of that. <laughs> Again, um, I was very impressed with the young man. Talking to him, I was very impressed with him. But when you found out uh, about his murder, what did you think? We keep killing us. We keep killing us. And I'm glad we had him for as long as we had him. Yeah, sad, uh, sad situation. Yeah. Uh, sad situation. I, I actually interviewed uh, this guy, Keefe D. He was actually in the car that killed Tupac. Oh, wow. Wow. And, and he broke down everything leading up to it and everything that happened afterwards. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, although there's a million conspiracy theories about Tupac that, you know, he's still alive or Suge had him killed or whatever mm -hmm. else, the, the reality of it is from the people that were actually there was that he went and beat up a guy. It was who, beef. Uh, I mean, it was actual gang beef at that yeah, point. Beef. Beat up a guy that was uh, a known gang member, uh, you know, was under investigation for multiple, mur multiple murders. They went and got a gun and retaliated mm -hmm. right away. And that's basically what happened top to bottom. Yeah. And uh, we ended up losing one of the great figures of our lifetime. I mean, imagine Tupac in 2020, oh, what man. he'd be doing. Man, just the the talent, the, the wit, the intelligence, how he would spin what's going on right now, you know? And he was a great actor. He was a really good actor. Oh, yeah. I mean, he killed it in Juice. He killed yeah. it in Poetic Justice. He killed it in Above the Rim. He was in Gridlock, Gang Related, Bullet, like so many movies. And he was only 25 and having multi-platinum albums on right. top of that. Uh, it, it was just ridiculous. Um, you know, so this movie ends up coming out roughly a year after Tupac's murder. Do you think that that kind of hurt the movie in terms of the rollout and the publicity and, and the promotion of it? Uh, I didn't really think about it, to be honest. Um, I didn't want to watch it for a while. I didn't watch it till it came on DVD. Um, Why is that? 
he was gone. Yeah. He was gone. And I just didn't, I didn't want to see him yet. And I think that's how most people felt, which is why I kind of prefaced it mm. in that way. As a Tupac fan, you're like, I don't want to watch this movie. I know he's not alive anymore. And, you know, it got filmed before he died. And it's just, uh, it's hard watching. You know, it Black, just, I'm sorry. It's hard watching Black Panther because of, um, yeah. yeah, it's like I generally. watch it and I go, "Wow, he's yeah. he's gone," you know. Yeah, kind of puts a dark cloud over the whole project in a way. Yeah, but then you realize that you know he was here for a reason, and he burned real hot, just like Tupac. He burned real mm -hmm. hot and bright. Yeah, and then was gone. So we have to be um, to relish the light we had. Yeah, I agree. Well, you did a few other movies. You did uh, U571. Mm -hmm. uh, that was with Matthew that McConaughey. And yeah. we were in Italy. We filmed that in Italy and Malta. How's that experience? I love Italy. <laughs> uh, the people are so, they were so welcoming. Excuse me, so welcoming, so friendly. Um, the actual filming was... Uh, was hard at times because we had to be in water. We had to um, be out in the ocean. And... But it was an interesting role to play because you didn't see um, very many African-American men in that position. Um, I did a little research and they weren't, you know, they weren't allowed to do certain things. But my character was able to work in the kitchen and do pretty much anything on that boat. You know, so I thought that was a strong presence to have. Well, and it kind of had an all-star cast. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, Bill Paxton, mm -hmm. rest in peace, uh, who, uh, you know, went on to do Big Love and, and a bunch of other dope projects. Uh, Harvey Keitel, you know, a, <laughs> Harvey. a, le a legend, a Harvey. legend in, in Hollywood. Harvey was funny. <laughs> he was funny. Uh, John Bon Jovi was in the movie. Mm -hmm. Uh Anything crazy happen, you know, when you get all these big personalities together in one room? So we were doing this scene where the water was rushing into the boat and we were supposed to be turning these valves, right? And they said, Harvey, you turn that valve over there. Well, the valve was like that big. And so he said, turn in the, <laughs> turn in the valve. And everybody just stopped and went. <laughs> he said, well, hey, it's the valve. This is what I'm doing, you know. Um, he was just really a, a great person to act with. He was very insightful. He was very knowledgeable about the craft and very fun to work with, too. Well, then in 2003, you did Final Destination 2. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I Which is a, a pretty big franchise. Yeah, yeah, and I'm not a horror movie person, so it was an interesting um, gig for me. You know. Yep. Uh, and then most recently, well, more recently, uh, you ended up on Greenleaf, the show, the mm -hmm. series, mm -hmm. uh, playing Reggie. Yep. Uh, and then uh, you also did Black Lightning. Mm -hmm. With Crest. Crest um, used to work on Living Single. He played Queen Latifah's mm -hmm. boyfriend. And so to be back on set with him was a wonderful thing. To see him in the lead character was just really great to see. I was so proud of him. Uh, yeah, man, great series, by the way. Black it Lightning. Is. It is. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, but then at one point, you got into video games. Yeah, when work started drying up, like I was doing video work um, while I was doing Living Single, but we pressed it after I um, left the show. Was Kratos like your first big video game voice? Yes. Yes, he was. First main character. Um, yeah. Right. And that was uh, God of War, which is one of the top selling video games ever? Yes. Yes, it is. Can you give us an example of Kratos? Zeus! I'm coming for you! Zeus! Your son has returned. I bring the destruction of Olympus! 
Love it. <laughs> Love it. Such a great game, by the way. I played the last one uh, on PlayStation 4. Uh, I yeah. Know you, you, you weren't in it. Uh, by PlayStation 4, someone else had taken over, right? But, uh, right. but such a great game, such a great concept. And I guess at one point, they they gave the voice of Kratos uh, to Christopher Judge. Mm-hmm. Because they needed to combine like the live action with the voice, and he was kind of bigger. Mm-hmm. Uh, so explain that. Well, before they were using two people. They were using me for the voice and another uh, mo- mocap actor for the body work. Um, and in the last game, I just don't think m- they did mocap on me, and I don't think it really worked because I'm small. I'm not a big, and I don't move like a big guy. I move like a small guy. And so um, Chris is a lot bigger than me. He's like I think he's like six four, six five, something like that. He's a big guy. And so it made sense to me. Again, it was how it was done. That's all. I mean, I don't, I, as an actor, you, you lose jobs all the time. You are done with jobs all the time. But when somebody lets you go, it's a respect thing for me. Just come and talk to me and say, hey, you know, thank you for your service, but we're going with an, an, in a different direction. Never got any call like that. Hmm. Well, and then at one point you started, uh, working on Star Wars, The Clone Wars. Yeah. You were Mace Windu. Yes, sir. And that that character, I mean, in the actual movies, originally was done by Samuel L. Jackson. Mm-hmm. Pre- pretty big shoes to fill. Yeah, yeah, they were, they were. <laughs> but um, uh, I'm, I'm trying to think of our director's name. Um, he's gonna kill me. But he, after we started, after the first um, season, he wanted to, um, me to get my find my own space in that character. So I tried to do something that was in between myself and Sam. Okay. Can we get an example of, of your version of Mace Ooh, Windu? I, man, you should have told me. I would have <laughs> wrote some things out. Come on. You are on this council, but we do not grant you the rights for so-and-so, whatever that was. He was, my Mace was more calm <laughs> Um, there were times when we were in battle where you could hear Sam, where I would reach for that. But he was uh, very even, and that that calming voice in the midst of all that other stuff. Yeah, I mean, listen, Star Wars probably had the biggest role in my childhood. You know, from the <laughs> the movies to the the Star Wars characters, you know, the toys to uh-huh. and so forth, and you know. Such an incredible franchise. I mean, with the Mandalorian. Right. I haven't watched that yet, days. though. You haven't watched the I haven't Mandalorian. I haven't watched the Mandalorian yet. Yeah. That's, that's the best show on television. Really? I would say that right now. Yeah. Now that it's back on. Yeah. Okay. It's that good. It's that good. Mm, okay. Yeah. Better than Lovecraft Country. Different. You know, you know. I mean, I watched all of Lovecraft Country. And maybe I just wasn't watching hard enough. Okay. But I was definitely confused by the end. <laughs> you know, like, like you okay. know, spoiler alert, you know, how the little girl with that monster at the end, I didn't quite understand what the monsters <laughs> represented and, and so forth. It was a cool series. I dug uh-huh, it. Uh-huh. I dug it. I don't know. Maybe maybe I shouldn't have been on my, on my laptop as much when I was watching it <laughs> on my phone. But. Okay. What about P-Valley? I like P-Valley. I mean, very different show than Mandalorian. <laughs> I mean, you know, as a man, I can see why why P Valley has an edge, has an edge. Definitely not a lot of nudity in Mandalorian on, on no, Disney Plus. No, no, we got Baby Yoda in Mandalorian. You know. <laughs> yeah, Baby Yoda versus you know the pole, uh, the pole, and strippers the pole. and thongs and all that. I mean, it's a hard. You know, I can see why that. You know, Baby Yoda can't compete with that, but yeah. <laughs> you know, Far- Fargo is a great show as well. I yeah, oh, I, I do pretty, like Fargo. The new, you know, with um, Chris Rock. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, there's a lot, a lot like of that. good television. Do you think overall, when you look at your career, do you think you've made more on the acting side or on the voiceover side? Acting, acting yeah. side, yeah, acting side. Just because the initial payout is more. And then you get residuals from that. And voiceover payout is less, but you get residual payments from that. Yeah. Well, people know you for being an actor, but really, music was your first love. Absolutely. And I, I mean, I think you said that uh, 
you feel that your acting kind of hurt your music career to a certain degree because you're the the actor who is you know looked at as dabbling in music when it's really kind of the other way around well and that's the thing like the door kind of swings one way you see a lot of singers that they allow to be actors whether they can or not but Actors that want to be singers, they always look at you like you're strange. Um, but again, I started in this business as a vocalist, not as an actor. Um, yeah. The acting came through musical theater and being on stage. Right. And your latest song is uh, Come Together. Actually, no, that's not the latest. Well, that's the one we put out. That's the video that we have out right now. But that's off my um, first album, which came out in 2000. Yeah. And it's a protest song. Um, it's a protest song. It's a come together song. It's a song to let people understand that this is not going to work unless we all come together and make it work. We can't be divided. We can't be divisive. Yeah, especially at a time like right now when, you know, <laughs> the election is over yeah. and yet the election is not, not over. It's not over. It's not over, you know. And to hear <laughs> the rhetoric from people, to hear how the venom that comes out of people's mouths because he didn't win. It's just, uh, we'll never move forward like that. But I don't, I don't know how we can change it. That's why I, I did the video. I wanted to use my voice to say something, you know, during this time period. Well, coming from a show like Living Single, and you know, you could say that, you know, the foundation of your success is Living Single, mm -hmm. which is based on four black women mm -hmm. as the leads. How does it feel to see a black woman vice president for the first time? <laughs> Can I just sit here and smile? <laughs> it is wonderful to know that my little goddaughter will grow up knowing that there was a black woman as a vice president. It's, it's amazing. And it's about time. I agree. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> We'll end it with that. T.C. Carson, <laughs> pleasure, pleasure Man. to finally speak with you. Long Thank you so fan. much, brother. I really appreciate the interview. You asked some hard questions. Well, kind of hard. Made me think. You made me think. Hey, this is, you know, you're an actor. I'm an interviewer. Yeah. <laughs> so you do what we you both, do. I do what I do. That's right. We both work on our craft and we've developed it over, you know, decades. Uh -huh. and, you know, we try to do the best job that we can. Well, you did a quite... You did a great job, bro. Thank great you. Great job. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, man, all the best. Looking forward to all the other projects that you you got coming up. And uh, you know, definitely appreciate everything. Oh, thank you, brother. Keep in touch. No doubt. All right. Take care. Peace.